Hey, good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. And I do appreciate you being with me. And listen, I, I've just got to mention this. Over the, uh, over the last month or whatever, I have been receiving some of the most absolutely wonderful private messages, uh, private messages through Facebook, private uh, emails, and what have you, uh, at, at a growing number, at a growing rate. And these, uh, these emails have been absolutely, incredibly wonderful. They are humbling. They are exciting. They are encouraging. To know that, <clears throat> pardon me, to know that the message of fulfillment is touching the hearts and the lives of an increasing number of people. And in the great majority of cases, these messages that I have received are from people I've never heard of before, I've never heard from them before, and yet they've reached out to express their appreciation for our ministry, for what we do here on Morning Musings. Almost, you know, five days out of the week, generally speaking. Uh, did you know that we currently have produced over 2,000 videos? Now, folks, that's a, that's a pretty good storehouse of information that we offer to you for free of charge. Now, <laughs> believe you me, we could certainly use your financial help at this time. Uh, COVID has just been brutal to us. Uh, we've, we've had families suffering, uh, <clears throat> not only personally, but their extended family. They've had to discontinue their support of our ministry. And uh, yeah, it's been brutal. Uh, I, I can't pull any punches about it. It's not, uh, it's not easy. And so if you are able at all to support our ministry but through m monthly uh, contributions or even one-time uh, contributions, believe you me, that is extremely, extremely helpful right now. But back to the point is that we just appreciate so tremendously the fact that our ministry is touching hearts and touching lives and changing lives. You know, I, I've heard from several people lately who once who were raised in dispensational homes living in fear of, you know, the man of sin and the rapture and the great tribulation, the abomination of desolation, et cetera, et cetera, just scared to death. But finding the message of fulfillment has restored their faith given them a peace of mind, a security, a, a, a joy of the security that they have in Christ, and the desire to look deeper and deeper into God's Word. And you know, it, it's kind of funny to me. It, it's sad on one level to be sure, but I have the enemies of covenant eschatology very often say, well, you know, preterism destroys faith. Well, not according to the people I hear from on almost a daily basis. On almost a daily basis, I hear from people who tell me that coming to an understanding of covenant eschatology has restored their faith in the Bible, has made their love of God and their love of Christ grow exponentially. And, you know, just the other day, I, I'm taking a little bit of time here to share something. Just the other day, one individual <clears throat> said, well, you know, full preterists just absolutely have to deal with the fact that there are people who abandon this movement. And my, my thought and my response to that is, this is new. There was an apostasy of the majority of believers in the first century, according to Luke 18. And Paul said, all of those in Asia have forsaken me. And so, 
if it's a strike against covenant eschatology, that there are those who abandon it. And you know, Jesus said there would be. Jesus said, when the seed is sown and persecution arises for fear of persecution, they abandon the faith. Yeah. Of course that happens. It happens in every single movement. And so for someone to jump up and say, preterism has to deal with the fact that there are people who abandon that movement. <laughs> and when I challenged this individual and said, what does this prove? All of a sudden, they said, well, it doesn't prove anything. Well, okay. If it doesn't prove anything, then why are you making the point? See, th this is argumentum ad desperatum. But I digress. And I got to move on. We continue our study uh, of the motif and the parable of the absent master in Matthew chapter 25, 14 and following. There, Jesus talked about a certain rich man who was going to go into a far country. And so he gathered his servants around him. He dispensed gifts to them and says, you occupy this, uh, these gifts and talents until I return. And after a long time, he returned. Well, we are told, this has to refer to the second coming of Christ. Well, it does that. But it must refer to the second coming of Christ at the end of time, to which it has no application whatsoever. I've been sharing with you the fact that in at least three or four of Jesus' parables, he discussed the absent master motif. And in those parables we find information that demands a first century return. Luke chapter 19, 11 and following, the master came back. And by the way, this is true of every single one of the parables on the absent master. The absent master came back in the very generation that he had, quote, left behind. There is no extended period of time, generation after generation after generation, pardon me, and then the return. It's just not there. So I want to begin today, and I've told myself I'm going to keep this uh, pretty short, okay? I, I don't know. I'll be honest. I don't know how many videos I'm going to make on this current text that I'm about to share with you in regard to the absent master. So, no promises, all right? We could, yeah, we used to have a saying in, in the seminary, when somebody found a text and boy, they were just going to town on it and they were doing a great job preaching and everything and we'd say, boy, they really waxed an elephant. <laughs> Meaning, they waxed eloquent, you know, okay. And so, a person could go to Hebrews chapter 9 and truly, really wax an elephant because Hebrews chapter 9 is absolutely, positively a major discussion of the absent master motif. And what Hebrews has to say about the return of that absent master demands a first century return. Now, I've asked you to consider the following. And I've had people tell me this. Okay, you have all of these uh, absent master parables. And it's true, we are told, and it is, it is admitted. We are told that, yes, uh, Jesus departed, Acts chapter 1. And yes, he came back. In A.D. 70, this is common among all millennialists. This is common among post-millennialists. Yeah, Jesus came back in A.D. 70. Oh, but that's not the return of the absent master. Well, in Mark chapter 13, in a text in which the only thing the apostles asked about was the, the coming de destruction of the temple, and Jesus answered their question, and he gave the parable of the absent master. 
That means it applied to AD 70. And so on the one hand, we are told by the amillennialists and the postmillennialists, yes, indeed, Jesus ascended to the Father, Acts chapter 1, and yes, indeed, Jesus came in A.D. 70. But we're still waiting for His real return. Seriously? Why don't we have a prediction of the third coming of Christ. As far as the New Testament is concerned, there is only one coming of the Lord that they had in view. And I know people say, no, 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 Pentecost, that was the coming of the Lord because that's the coming of the Holy Spirit. No, the coming of the Holy Spirit was the absence of Christ. Oh, and we've got Jesus coming to the churches. The seven churches of Asia, repent or else I come against you and I'll come quickly. No, that was A.D. 70. So I want to take us, and I'm I'm basically out of time for today. Hebrews chapter 9, I'll just simply quote the the passage that you are the most familiar with. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of the many, And to those who eagerly look for him or wait for him, he shall appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Well, like I said, we could truly, truly wax an elephant on this passage. I'm just going to set it before you today so that you'll give it some thought and we will begin discussing it On the flip side, I'll see you on Thursday.